Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. The Supreme Court has ruled that Americans have a broad right to arm themselves in public. New York has made enormous efforts over many years to prevent individuals from carrying guns in public. What happens now? We'll put that question to one of the nation's foremost experts on the laws covering the purchase, possession, and use of firearms. He's Richard Aborn, a lawyer, the current president of the Citizens Crime Commission of New York City, and the former president of Handgun Control, Inc., which is now the Brady Campaign. Richard, welcome back. Thank you. Good to see you. You too. Great to have you here. So um, I guess we'll start with the basics. Um, if you'll be kind enough to explain um, the Supreme Court ruling and the New York state law that it struck down. Sure. So if the case is called Bruin. Um, it was brought by, in essence, the NRA using a local state affiliate, the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. And they sued to challenge the New York State Sullivan Law, which has been on the books since 1911, which is essentially the model gun control law for the United States. Right. If we could have the Sullivan Law throughout the United States, we would not be talking about gun violence. And they said that the Sullivan Law, which restricts the carrying in public absent a special license, violates the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment right to have a gun. This case was particularly important because it was the first time that someone had challenged a carrying law on Second Amendment grounds trying to extend the right found in a case called Heller, which is the first Second Amendment case. Heller found that there was a constitutional right to have a gun in the home for self-defense. The Bruin case sought to and successfully succeeded in extending that right to carrying concealed. So that portion of the Sullivan Law in New York State has now been struck down. But the New York State Legislature, using language in the Bruin uh, decision, quickly passed legislation that restricts the carrying concealed to what are, from what are called sensitive places. That's language from the case. Sensitive places are the things that you would think about. Houses of worship, yep. bars, entertainment venues, schools, buses, public transportation, Times Square. These are all places where you cannot carry a concealed weapon, notwithstanding the Bruin case. And that will be challenged. That will be challenged. The New York State Legislature also passed a bill which bans the purchase of semi-automatic rifles unless you're 21 or older, enhanced background checks for people seeking to get a gun, enhanced safety training requirements, enhanced safe storage requirements, all things that made sense. But interestingly, and similar to the federal bill that passed, a a new provision that pushes what are called red flag laws. Right. Red flag laws are laws that give neighbors, social workers, mental health professional, police, clergy, who may have reason to know that a gun owner, a legitimate gun owner, a lawful gun owner, may be a danger to himself, it's usually a guy, himself or herself, or someone else, to call the police and say, here's what's going on, you really need to take those guns out of the home. The police now have the ability to do that based on those phone calls. They can remove those guns from the home if there's a danger, an imminent danger. And then three days later, there's a judicial hearing to this, for a court to decide whether or not that removal was proper. Now, that federal legislation, which President Biden signed, mm -hmm. so it's the law of the land, um, it got a tremendous amount of attention. It had been a long time um, since there had been any kind of federal legislation controlling, restricting gun, gun ownership or gun usage. Um, and I wondered at the time as I read and watched the stories whether it was as big a deal as it was being made of. What do you think? Was that legislation really a big deal? So we ask a hard question, and, we, <laughs> and we've got to put the answer into context. Um, as, as you know, I helped write and then steered the assault weapon ban and the ban on large magazines through Congress. 20 plus years ago. Which worked. Which worked. Worked right. really well, which right. is a separate conversation. Yep. Maddeningly, we have to have a separate conversation about that. That should still be on the books. So the, the federal law that was passed by the president, it, it's certainly good. It's better than nothing. 
Um, it is not everything we need, but I am very conscious, both having been there and knowing what's going on now, that it's almost impossible because the country is so divided to pass any federal legislation around guns. So the fact that it was done is good. And there's a, a, there's a very subtle political point in this, which nobody's actually writing about, which has surprised me, is I believe, you, you know, the Republicans came to the table on this. The Republicans don't come to the table on guns unless there's some really compelling yep. reason, really compelling reason. And frankly, it's not gun safety. There was a political reason. And the political reason I believe they came to the table was they were f afraid of the women's vote in suburbs in the upcoming November right. elections. They were afraid of alienating that. They got hit with abortion, and then they got hit with a gun decision. Yep. So they had to do something on guns. That's a nice break, and maybe we can build on that going forward. But the bill also did red flag laws, interestingly enough. These are now sweeping the country, which is a very good thing. It put about $750 million into violence prevention, mental health courts, and helping veterans readjust after service. Huge problem with veterans and gun suicide, so we do need to address that. Um, and it also increased the, what are called enhanced background checks for 18 to 21 year olds, as a slightly deeper dive into their backgrounds, which is equally important. So I'm happy it passed, but we have a long way to go. Um, even given the New York state law that passed and the new federal legislation, what practical effect do you think the Supreme Court ruling will have, uh, especially in big cities like like New York? Massive, massive, massive. massive. What do you expect? Um, to here, I expect you see a lot more people seeking permission to carry a gun now. Right? They will they will get a license to carry a gun and therefore be able to carry it anywhere concealed except in these sensitive places. More guns has never equaled more. <laughs> more <laughs> right, exactly. More guns equals more deaths. So that that's a problem in and of itself. But the larger problem. Is that, is that the NRA will use the language in the Bruin decision to challenge every single gun control law that's put up and many that already exist. Don't forget, the Bruin decision itself is already an extension of the Heller decision. Right. So they're gonna try and keep extending this constitutional argument to the point where they would like to eradicate all gun control laws and their goal, and I know this for a fact, is to have a national carry law. So that if you get a permit, let's say, or a license in Wyoming, you can carry that gun anywhere in the country. Think about that. Think about the conditions that people carry guns in Montana versus New York. Do we exactly. really want to be that heavily armed a nation? And, and you know, we're armed against ourselves. I'm, I'm waiting for the time in New York, and it's going to happen as the guns proliferate. We're going to see the story where someone's shot to death over a parking dispute of in, gonna in, in New York City. Of course City. it's going to happen. The other thing that's already happening, and this is probably unrelated to Bruin and more related to the rapid rise in crime, is we are seeing record number of legal gun sales taking place in 2020 and 2021, and now even in 2022. Um, we know that through the, ba the Brady background check system. Um, and we also know that there's a record number of guns in New York City, and the reason we know that is that the NYPD has seized more guns in the last two years than I think in the last 20 years. Um, so there's an enormous surge of guns. And as I said before, more guns, more death. This is not complicated. We have to go after these guns and get them out of our society. Um, one of the weird things that I've been noticing personally is that people um, who I know um, in New York, but also in, in the suburbs around New York, um, who are rational, law-abiding, what you and I might think of as pretty normal folks, um, are now talking about buying guns and, and saying, you know what, um, crime is, is spiraling out of control again. Um, you have these uh, rulings from the Supreme Court. More and more people are going to have guns. I feel like I need a gun to protect myself. What's your response to a sane, law-abiding citizen who was thinking that way? So it's rational, normal, and scared. Scared, And yeah. scared. Yeah. That's, that's the quotient that's new. We have not had this notion of being scared for a long time. So there is a danger inherent in this, which is this misbelief that a gun is this panacea of safety. It actually is not, and the data really shows us that. Just even objectively, before I give you the data, think about how many people really have pulled out a gun in an act of self-defense and stopped an event. It's rare. 
I can tell you, I was a homicide DA in this town for years. I prosecuted many a homicide case where someone pulled out a gun or a knife or a mace to try and stop a robbery and ended up getting killed right. as a result. Yep. So you have that danger. The second danger is that the risk of suicide in the home when there's a gun present goes up dramatically. And if there are youth in the home, the, uh, the um, chance of suicide by the gun goes up fivefold. And the reason is when you go to kill yourself with a gun, you can't stop the process. Once you pull that trigger, it's over. If you take pills, it takes some time. You have to hang yep. yourself. You gotta go through all the steps. Lots of time to reflect. With a gun, it's done. And kids are impetuous. Yep. You know, if you raise a 17 year old, you know, they're, they're impetuous. And then of course, there's the huge number of accidental shootings that take place when a little kid finds oh, Papa's my gun. Oh so shoots tragic. His sister shoots himself, shoots his <clears throat> friend. It's awful. So the, getting a gun is an awesome responsibility. You need to be constantly trained, know when to use it, know the law. It, it is not a panacea of safety. You know, um, I was in the military many, many moons ago, and um, you have all these guys, we were all very young, uh, intense training on, on, on weaponry, which was great, um, but I can't even tell you how many foul-ups there were even in that kind of a setting with intense training. I mean, there were just mishaps or foolishness or, or, or things that, that went on. It, it, it frightens the heck out of me, the idea of having all these civilians with these guns out here. And there's another interesting corollary to that. Um, let, let's take it in a civilian setting. So police are obviously heavily, heavily, heavily trained right. with firearms usage, when they should shoot, when they can pull it out, how to store it, all these things. And what do we have? We have suicide yep. by gun for cops. We have accidental discharges at all, at, at, all the time. And interestingly enough, if you look at the number of shots fired in a shooting, and the number of hits, the number of times they actually strike the target, <laughs> it's microscopic. It's a high intensity combat stress filled situation. And they're highly trained. They're and, highly and they're trained. And they're not hitting their exactly. target. So pity the poor civilian who never pulls that gun out that suddenly pulls it out. They're not going to hit the target and they're likely to kill themselves. One of the most foolish things I hear frequently is when people are talking about police shootings, uh, police killings. Killings. Uh, they frequently will say, they didn't have to kill him. Why didn't they just shoot him in the leg or something or shoot him in the shoulder? It doesn't work like that in this highly stressed situation that you're talking about. And the, the accuracy is, is, is absurd. It, it, yeah, so it's, it, that's it, myth. It's not that's television. Yeah. But beyond that, you're trained not to shoot to wound. You're trained, if you're going to legitimately fire your weapon, to shoot to kill. I think that's both, I, I know that's the case in the military. I think that's the case with police it, officers. It as is well. because the police are trained that they cannot use their firearm unless there's a threat of imminent deadly force, exactly. deadly force right. against themselves or against somebody else. So by making the decision to pull out the gun and fire, they are acknowledging that there's deadly force and you have to meet deadly force with deadly right. force. So sure, they're trained to hit body mass or in the head if, if, right. if need be. They're not trained to shoot in the foot. But even if they were, they're not going to be. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. This is and you're going to end up stuff. getting killed. I mean, you, you, you're, you're firing at someone with, with a weapon and you shoot and, and miss, you, you have a major league problem. So. Think of how many times you hear a news report, let's say in New York, of a, of a wild shot that hits a one-year-old. All the time. Or a woman walking by or a child sitting in their home. All the time. All the time. You have the same thing on the yeah. streets. So, um, you know, these uh, tragic mass shootings, especially at schools, um, get most of the media attention. And it's, it's, it's understandable why that would be the case. Um, and uh, we don't want to minimize how tragic yeah. that is. It's, 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 it's horrible. But that's not the way most um, gun violence occurs. Tell us how it, what, the, what the real situation is with gun violence across the country. So the mass shootings are tragic. They shock us to the core because they normally occur in places that we consider very safe. Right. Our schools, our churches, our synagogues, our grocery stores, for heaven's sakes. Those are safe places, so it shatters us. And we're also shattered by the number of people that are killed at any one time. We're, we're having a mass shooting in the United States almost every day now. Incredible. Four or more people killed unrelated to another act of violence. But the vast number of Americans are killed in crimes that take place in urban areas of New York, of New York, sorry, urban areas of America every single day. It's street crime. A lot of it's gang retribution, which is terrible. A lot of it is people, bystanders being killed 
during gang retribution shootings. A lot of it is robbery. It's just what we call traditional crime. That's where the bulk of, and it's mostly young men and mostly right. young men of color, are being killed. And it's mostly in the most challenged parts of our cities, places where there's inadequate schools, inadequate housing, inadequate income, um, inadequate health care, et cetera. There's environmental disjustice. The environmental pollutants are in these areas. This is all unfair, and it leads to very, very challenged, sometimes shattered lives. So that's where we're seeing the crime take place, and that's where the bulk of people are killed. There's also a very large number of people that die by suicide and by accident, but the concentration, which we can stop relatively quickly, the concentration needs to be on the urban violence, and that's where gun control laws are so badly needed, plus all of these interventions that we now know work. But that requires a big investment, and we need to be willing to make that investment. Now, um, when Republicans and others argue against gun control um, measures, one of the things they talk about, they, they constantly harp on mental health. And they, um, they insist that the, the reason these tragic killings uh, occur is primarily because of mental health. People are not in their right mind. That's why they go out and, and kill somebody. Um, what's the truth about the connection between mental health or mental illness on the one hand and gun violence. So, so let me just, if I may, just make one comment first. Um, the reason we have these mass shootings is not mental health. It's because mostly young men, not always, the Las mm -hmm. Vegas shooter was in his 50s, but mostly young men can walk into a gun store, buy an assault weapon, buy two or 300 rounds of ammunition and a magazine to carry them, and they go out and do the shooting. Take those guns away, as we did when we banned assault weapons, and the mass shootings are done. It's over. You may have a mass stabbing, but that would be really, right. really, really rare really rare. So there is some intersection, some minor intersection that we see between mental health and mass shootings, but it doesn't drive every mass shooter. A lot of these people are driven, and we do a lot of work in this space, a lot of these people are driven by what we call grievances. They're angry at blacks, they're angry at Jews, the Tree of Life synagogue, the Buffalo shooting. Yeah. They're angry at something because of their school the Uvalde shooting or Sandy yep. Hook or any of these schools. It's a grievance they have that, they're, that, they are, that they are acting on when they do these sorts of mass shootings. Now, would some sort of mental health intervention help? Very possibly. To be successful at this though, we need to develop better early warning systems. We need to have a more acute understanding of what indicators a person is exhibiting that show that they might be having a tendency to engage in this sort of violence. We're running a project we call Signals Now, which seeks to stop mass shooters and extremists, whether they're jihadis or domestic terrorists, because they will send out signals before they engage in these acts. But we need to be trained to recognize those signals, and we need to provide those people who may receive the signals, once they understand what they're hearing, what to do. So we're working on this right. massive project with funding to try and provide those sorts of mechanisms. Now, there's been a, a surge in violent crime, not just in New York City, but a, a, across uh, much of the country during the COVID years. Um, do you have a sense of, what, and, and we're talking about violent crime, we're talking about homicides, uh, and in fact, in 2020, uh, I think 45,000, more than 45,000 Americans were killed, died from gun-related injuries, which was the highest uh, on record. Um, so, uh, do you have a sense of uh, what was driving that and what, if any, was the link between COVID and this surge in violence? So I hate to use that word, but it's complicated. And I think <laughs> I, it really is complicated. And those who say that it's A or B, I, to be honest, they don't know what they're talking about. The older I get, the more I find that everything, everything is, is complicated. complicated. But because it is, right? Yeah. Human behavior is something that's very difficult to understand. It's not a predictable uh, quotient in life. So violent crime actually started going up before COVID. It started going up in the second quarter of 2019. Then it accelerated when COVID hit. So let's, let's talk a little bit about why COVID drove some of the crime. So there has been an enormous destabilization within society, in part by COVID, and if I may be perfectly blunt, because of the Trump administration was such an erratic force in our society that we're seeing our society fracture and fracture and fracture. We no longer talk about tribes. We now talk about micro tribes. We are so badly fractured. We just cannot seem to agree on everything. Misinformation, malinformation 
is the, is the word of the day. We now live in a post-truth society. We all feel destabilized by that. Imagine if you're a young man of 16 or 17 or 18 who is likely homeless, is likely trying to get a meal every night, suddenly finds that the government supports he or she had are gone, the government rec centers they were going, recreation centers, that they were going to are shut, the support that was going to the home is gone, the government's destabilized. Your already unstable life becomes all the more unstable. That's an accelerant. When that happens within a gang setting, and gangs permeate our cities, you get all these retribution shootings. I don't know the exact data, but I would imagine well over 50 to 60 percent of the homicides in just say New York City are gang related. Right. It's some sort of retribution from a gang. So you have that happening as well. You also have this huge surge of guns that are coming in, fueling this violence. More guns, more death. You also have, and I want to speak honestly about this, you have all these criminal justice reforms that have taken place. And I think we have to be very careful about how we talk about these, because it's undoubtedly true that some of the reforms have, have fueled a bit of the spike. And I can, I can take you down into the data and show you where that's happened. Right. But I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true that the criminal justice reforms have driven this expansion of crime. I think that's not a valid argument. And I think we need to be very straight about that. Because a lot of the criminal justice reforms that took place were very needed. I was in the system for a long time. I could see where there were reforms were needed. And now right. that I'm outside the system, I work very hard to reform the criminal justice system. Justice has to be just. Right. The fundamental aspect of justice is fairness. It has to treat everybody equally. Our system was not treating everybody equally. So you have this large combination of events taking place. Then you had the whole defund the police movement. Oh my goodness. Further destabilize things. And then in the wake of the flake shooting, you had all of this anti-cop rhetoric taking right. place and the alienation of cops who in turn themselves get alienated, <laughs> right? Who wouldn't? They're human beings, I'm sorry. So you have all, of, it's complicated. You have all of these factors that have occurred at the same time over about a you know, 24 to 36 month period that's resulted in this explosion of crime. And we're having trouble now getting it back to where it was in 20, say, 16, 17, 18. Homicides in New York, as you know, are down slightly, they're down about 10%, but over 21. Right. Shootings are down 8 or 9% this month, but down over 21. They're way up over 16, 17, 18. Right. Uh, so we have to get back to those levels. If you had all of the resources and the political support that you needed, um, what steps uh, would you take um, to eliminate as much as possible gun violence in this country? Mm, I call this the magic wand question. <laughs> I, no, I love it because the why I love this question is that it illustrates that despair does not dominate over hope in this arena. Mm -hmm. There is plenty of hope to believe that we can get this under control. We need a massive federal gun control bill. This is a magic wand, which does essentially what New York does. Licensing, registration, mandatory safety training, one gun a month. You would knock gun trafficking out tomorrow night if you limited sales to one gun a month, and I can explain that, um, and smart gun technology so that only the purchaser of a gun can fire the gun. That's the legislative side. On the intervention side, we need a lot more money to identify early warning systems right. for people that are going to engage in shootings. And we also need warning systems to understand when people are beginning to go off the right track. I'm doing a, a big project with MIT and Harvard down in Columbia, looking at six cities in that nation to see, using AI and big data, to see when people start to go off the track. We call it the vector point. Right. We need to identify that vector point, big deal. We need to talk with parents about the way they store guns and the way they talk with their kids about guns if they're gonna keep a gun in the home. And there are legitimate reasons, sporting, hunting, self-defense, et cetera. Um, you would have to do all of those things, but you'd really have to focus on the trafficking, the illegal trafficking, both legislatively and through interdiction, through interstate strike forces that go after the dirty gun dealers. We call them the dirty gun dealers. Gun, guns are sold on the streets illegally, but they start out legally. Right. They start out in states where there are no gun control laws, they're bought in bulk, then they're transported to cities that have strong gun control laws and sold illegally on the streets. It's been a plague in New York for decades, I 100%. guess. 100%. It's exactly right. It's an epidemic. It's a continuing epidemic. We can crack down on that, but that's going to take a coordinated effort between um, local state police, local urban police, and ATF. 
and, and DOJ, DOJ, FBI. Right. Um, that can be done. And the reason I'm confident it can be done is twofold. One, the number of dirty dealers that sell guns in the illegal market is actually strikingly small. And we know who they are. We can identify them. They just need to be investigated. And I'm sorry, but prosecuted. Right. And New York State has the authority to prosecute gun dealers in Georgia that sell guns into the New York State market. We need to do that as well. If we can combine all of these things, all of these things, uh, we can start reducing this. But we cannot disassociate ourselves when we talk about gun violence from, from the conditions that a lot of kids in this nation are growing up in. If we don't have an honest conversation about that and understand those challenges, these, these problems will persist. So yes, do all these things on the gun front, but understand equally important, we have to address the lives that a lot of these kids face. It's unforgivable that we don't do it in a more robust way. Um, this has been great. We've uh, run out of time. It's always a pleasure to talk to Thank you, you, Richard. We've been talking with uh, Richard Aborn, president, president of the Citizens Crime Commission of New York City. Um, thank you, Richard. My pleasure. And um, thank you, viewers. We'll see you next time.